Thursday, the 28th of March. Listener, thank you so much for joining us here on the Totally Football Show. Charlie Akosher of The Athletic is with us. Charlie. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, Benji Lanyardo of... Remind me where you're from, Benji. That's Pickfair, pickfair.com. Like it Jimbo. says on your T-shirt. As it does, as it yeah. does. Noted picture sharing, but also picture pimping. Uh, <laughs> It's, website. It's, it's a platform. It's Jimbo. a platform. A million users. I've now. got pics, but I don't want to be. You want a website. With you want a website. But yeah. You, you, it's a bit complicated. And you don't I know how want to do a all the stall production. in your online market. Sure. Okay. We're going to provide everything you need, Jimbo, if you're an amateur you photographer. Right. Any kind of criteria on what kind of pics are involved or not? Anything. We're about really? the love of photography. It doesn't matter on your skill level, complete beginners. We've got professionals on there. All the photographers, Jimbo. A million of them now on PicFair. A million yeah. photographers. Tom Williams is here. Hey, hello, Tom. James. Hello, hello. All right. Tom's back from his evening with Wales and gnashing of teeth. Tom, so sorry about how it turned out on Tuesday. The bitterest way. The bitterest way for you to miss out. Yeah, I mean, penalty shootouts, obviously pretty painful. Mm. Um, and also just, I don't know, you, you just makes you realise what a what a cruel thing sport is yeah. and what a cruel sport football is in particular that after you know 120 minutes of deadlock mm. it all boils down to one poor unfortunate soul yeah Dan James not scoring a penalty well yeah and you know Welsh dreams were dashed so they were Benji have you got any words any words of comfort for Tom yeah um I, and I was sort of thinking about saying this before. I don't know if it's patronising. Is it about Pickfair? No, no, no. I mean, I listen to Jimbo. We can talk all day about Get a picture of Tom now Pickfair. looking really upset. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to print and produce your own photography? No, sorry. Um, I thought, considering this was the first sort of tournament run post Gareth Bale, mm -hmm. it's pretty decent to get to where you got to. Did, were Welsh fans expecting that or were they expecting to get there at the beginning of the campaign? <laughs> I think that the bar has been raised so high in recent years that there's an expectation that Wales will be in the mix for automatic right. qualification. They weren't drawn in a particularly difficult group and they didn't make a great fist of it. Um, obviously, you know, no Gareth Bale and no Aaron Ramsey, although he was fit um, on Tuesday, means that you don't have those sort of magician footballers who can get you out of a hole on their own. But... You know, some of Wales' recent performances, you know, we beat Croatia mm. in October, who are one of the best teams in the mm. world. Very convincing against Finland last week. I, I think, and also, you know, it is easier to qualify for European Championships than it mm. was before, before they expanded the tournament. We knew that we had the backup policy of a playoff place via the Nations League. So, uh, you know, uh, in the wider context of the Welsh national team, getting this close is, mm. is a decent effort. But I think because we've... You know, almost got used to qualifying in, in recent you were, years. And you were that close as well. You were one kick from mm. glory. Well, in actual fact, Rob Page has said this a couple of times, that we were one mm. kick away. Well, but technically actually, speaking, two, yes. we were at least two kicks at least away. Two kicks, right, yeah. But you can kind of, you can see where he's yeah. coming from. Question. When you, um, when you are watching a penalty shootout and the thing you don't want to happen happens, this is on telly, sorry Tom, I know you were there. Do you, I, so I immediately turn off. Mm. Like mm. as soon as I saw Dan James's face, you can, and it's like horrible when you see the face of this guy whose world is just collapsing in on himself, right? I don't, I, I don't want to see anything else. Then I turn it off. I know if, some people that are like, no, I want to sit there and absorb and watch the pain. J you're a sicko, Jimbo. You no, no, I was just going to ask the question: whether do you think ever during a uh, penalty shootout when it goes the wrong way, any of those players, including possibly even the person who's taken it, thinks, "Oh, I've got the summer off." <laughs> No, I mean, some of them. Some I of them. Think oh, I think it happens. I think it's the worst some thing in the world. I think it happens. No, no. Not, not in, I don't think it's an immediate thought. Yeah. But there are some players dislike going to big tournaments, being away from home for mm. you know weeks on end. Or some might have a wedding or something. They were like, for oh, example, now I get to go to that wedding. That would one thing miss. I would say is that um, if you scored your penalty yes. in the shootout, yeah. it was quite notable that like. Um, like when, when Nico Williams scored yeah. his penalty I thought he was going to be the one to miss by the way but when he scored his and um, uh, he sort of was going back to the halfway line like with a big smile on his face 100% I thought exactly the same thing and because Chesney's trying to psych him out mm. and he deals with that really well I do think he could probably sleep quite well that night knowing like I did put mine away. Was Chesney shouting at Dan James before? I, I heard some shouts. I, I wondered if it was Chesney. I, I don't know. I oh. didn't, I, I've not seen any... It's possible. He was definitely doing the kind of mind games. But I do think as well now, 
football has changed in the sense that I don't think, well, Tommy, you'll know this much better, but I don't feel like Dan James will become a kind of figure of hate well, in, the, in the way that, you know, you think of like now Saka missed that penalty. Rash, I know in the Saka. immediate aftermath. Yeah, but there was horrendous abuse then. Mm. But I feel like now things Do you things think other move... things were conf- conflated with that beyond the fact that it was <sighs> well, know, other societal issues? Well, so. yes, but I mean, I think nowadays people... In the moment, it's horrible, but people mm. move on. Right. More quick. Whereas, like, Paul Bowden mm. was a sort of bogeyman of Welsh football for mm. years and years but after. Then that was a penalty in it was. the game rather than a shootout. And sure. also, we shouldn't forget that, you know, penalty shootouts were, a, were still a relatively new phenomenon in international mm. football in the, in the 80s and the 90s. Whereas now we're used to them. You're yeah. used to the dramaturgy of mm. the penalty shootout. We now know that it's unfair to, to slam the guy who misses or fails to score the Particularly fatal penalty. Down, down. Yeah, because yeah. that was such an unfortunate mm. position. Usually, if you miss a penalty, it's not the end of the world, unless you happen to be the guy who's lost. But because it had been nine good penalties, mm. five perfect po- Polish ones, and five good ones, for, sorry, four good ones from Wales, that it was down to the first one that gets missed is that. And that, I think, was what was particularly unfortunate. And as, you know, because you know, when you're watching the game, you have no idea who's going to take the next penalty until they start the walk towards the penalty mm. area. And as soon as I thought it was Dan James... Obviously, you're thinking don't miss because you think that for every player who goes up. But for mm. Dan James in particular, who is such a curious footballer, like remarkable physical attributes, one of the fastest footballers mm. in the world. But the thing, the stick that is used to, to, to beat him, you know, time and time again is lack of composure. Mm. And, you know, when the pressure's off, he can do it. And he scored a beautifully taken goal against Finland mm. at the same end of the ground in front of the Canton stand last Thursday. Robs the centre-back, rounds the keeper, slots it in, 4-1 through to the final. Everyone's very happy. And so for a player whose composure specifically mm. is repeatedly kind of, you know, Question. zeroed in on, to have his composure tested in Good those fire circumstances. Fire. Yeah. And, and, and to, I mean, I, I don't think people will, I don't think he'll be sort of, you know, massacred in the press like he might have been if this had been you know the 1990s or something but it's unfortunate for James because he is this kind of sort of perennial nearly man he does loads of great things and I think if he's in a really kind of supportive environment he can be a game-changing footballer but there is this oh man he just doesn't really occasionally goes to pieces in the penalty area occasionally makes the wrong decisions and this is the most brutal exposing kind of yeah. of that yeah, yeah. 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 what well, yeah. did Brennan Johnson come off when he did Brennan Johnson came off because he wasn't Having a particularly influential um, game, I mean, his form for Spurs of late has been brilliant. Mm. He's, he's, he's in the best period of his, uh, you know, his nascent career as a, as a, as a Spurs player, but he, he wasn't having a huge amount of joy. Wales weren't getting the ball to their most creative players in dangerous areas. So Brennan Johnson was pretty quiet. Harry Wilson was pretty quiet. And when... Page sent Dan James on for Johnson. There was no sort of sense of oh, you know, what's he, what's mm. he doing? Because I think Wales fans know what Dan James can do, and he can be a, a, a game-changing figure. What was slightly curious with regards to the substitutions was that about 15 minutes after James came on for Johnson, and that was like for like, James just played off Kiefer Moore, who was the lone striker. Page had to take off Connor Roberts, who was playing right wing back, and he sent on David Brooks. And I thought, oh, okay, well, he's going to switch to a back four now. He'll move Nico Williams, who is a right back by trade, over to the right hand side from left wing back. Ben Davis will move out to left back, um, and you'll have slightly more attacking players around Kiefer Moore. But he didn't. He put Dan James at right wing back, which meant he was just a million miles mm. away from Kiefer Moore. Mm. And Poland had an awful lot of the ball in extra time, so there was space in behind them that Wales could have potentially exploited. But the fastest player was spending all his time tracking Poland's left wing back back towards his own goal. Do you, in the aftermath, uh, have you begun to kind of think back about why Wales let it get to a penalty shootout? Like during the game? Or no. just during the ca- the campaign in, in particular? No, no, in, during specifically that game. The, the Wales looked the better side, no? I mean, I, th- I thought they were two very evenly matched sides. Okay. Two quite unspectacular sides, like very solid. I mean, yeah, Poland didn't have a shot on target no. in 120 minutes. Uh, not that Wales had you know that many themselves. It wasn't like Wales created chance after chance to put the game to bed. Poland were kind of constantly keeping them at arm's length. Mm. And it, it was one of those games that just felt like it was heading to penalties yeah. once yeah. you got to about the, the 70th <clears throat> minute. So I think the regrets in this campaign are with regard to losing at home to Armenia last summer, 
drawing against Armenia late on in, in the qualifiers. Those were the games that really sort of torpedoed Wales's chances. And, you know, even, even despite beating Croatia, which was a phenomenal result, mm. they weren't able to build on that. So, yeah, there is, there is a sense that I think Wales... And Wales's players and Wales's coaching staff, they, they don't get the free pass they might have got in years gone by when we weren't used to qualifying yeah. for things. On the plus side, you were rubbish at the World Cup, so Poland might be a better component for this. Going, yeah, I mean, going into a really tough group we, as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we were so that, awful at the World Cup, yeah. and we are we have missed out on a, you know, a pretty terrifying group with France, Netherlands... And, and Austria. Austria. Ralph Rannick's reborn Austria. Ralph Rannick's reborn Austria. But Wales have looked a lot better, and this the kind of post bail. I hesitate to say post Ramsey transition because he's mm. still there, although the you know suggestions mm. he might be an, about to announce his international retirement. But this team has moved on since the World Cup. It, the, you know, they're not. You don't look at them and think, oh, if only Gareth Bale was there. They're capable right. of winning matches without him. So I, I, I feel and like had third and go through the group. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. You know. So I, f- I feel like had we qualified, we we wouldn't have stunk the place out quite as much as we did in Qatar. But you know, I guess, <laughs> I guess we will who, never know. Who will you be? Who will you be rooting for this summer? Um, I mean, having uh, having a book about French football that comes out. Have you Tom? two months before the tournament? It would probably be, it would be helpful for me if if France either win it. Okay. Or have a complete meltdown. <laughs> mm-hmm. Everyone turns on each other and they Something go out, worthy. go out in the group phase. So as long as it's not a kind of meek quarterfinal exit, I right. will, you know, I'll Tom's take it. Tom's book Va Va Voom, a history of French football. Oh, just stop. The modern history of French football <laughs> will be available on April, April twenty fifth. April twenty fifth. Making sure that all the. Uh, it's All a really nice cover and a nice spine as well. Sometimes you should judge a book by its cover. Yeah. I mean, obviously, one should not judge a book by its cover, as we know. But if you want to, That's a good before you've had a chance to do. read it and you yeah. like the cover, then, you know... It's going to look good on your bookshelf, which is judge away. half the job of a book, I'm going to suggest. Indeed. What do you think, Tom's the over-under during the tournament for a tweet of sort of like, enjoying watching France play? Why not tuck into uh, this book of it? It's hard. There probably you will be do some. It, I think you? as long as you do it in a self-deprecating way... Yeah. Oh, that's then, not been tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's the that's the you know that's the sweet spot. Nah, you, go you've got to hit. Just yeah. full sales. Send the man in the pick fair yeah. t-shirt. Exactly. <laughs> it's the truth. What are you trying to hide? Sell your books. All right. Well, you know what? There were other international matches that took place uh, this midweek. For a start, there were two more finals for places at Euro 2024. Georgia picked up one of them, beating Greece after a similarly goalless 120 minutes. They then went to penalties. They won 4-2 on spot kicks, claiming thus their first ever major tournament plays. Woohoo! Which is nice, bit of variety. Mm. They're in a group with Portugal, Turkey, and the Czech Republic. So, hmm, not easy. Ukraine also will be at Germany 2024. They came from behind to beat Iceland 2-1 in their final. Genoa's Albert Goodmanson opened the scoring. He's in some rare form, four goals in two internationals for Iceland over the last week or so. Ukraine then came roaring back with a, a, a gorgeous curling shot from Viktor Sagankov. And then, uh, oh, Mudrik mm. out of Chelsea got the winner late on. And there was much rejoicing. They go into the group of Belgium, Slovakia and Romania. And given the huge numbers of Ukrainian folk who've moved across because of the uh, mm. Russian invasion to Germany, They've taken in, I think, more refugees than any other mm. nation, the Germans. They will probably have a... Their games will probably have quite the home atmosphere. And they're probably going to be everyone's second team, aren't they? I would hope. Yeah. Maybe Tom's a, first team. Ah, see, Tom, yeah, you yeah, I mean, selfishly I, plugging your book. I am. I am in the market You'd for be a team, behind so... behind poor old Ukraine. It's a pretty uh, presentable-looking group as well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you, you'd, sort of, you'd definitely back them to get through that. Belgium, Slovakia and Romania. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. What else happened in internationals? Listener, we'll be rounding up the rest of the big headlines next. So, Euro 2024 host Germany continued their recent bounce under Julian Nagelsmann after beating France the other day. They then had themselves a comeback 2 1 victory over the Netherlands. Bart Verbruggen did his best to hold the Germans at bay, the uh, Brighton keeper. He, he looked very good, but uh, they were too strong. Maximilian Mittelstadt. Uh, with a lovely shot to equalise after his error had led to Joey Verman volleying in early doors. And then uh, Fulkrug, who can't stop scoring as well, 
uh, headed in a winner in the 85th minute. Hmm. Stop me if you wanted to leap in because you really enjoyed any of these games. France, who, as I mentioned, were beaten by Germany last weekend, also came from behind. They beat Chile 3-2, a game which featured probably, Tom, you were across this in some way, shape or form because you're a big expert on French football and it's modern history. Did you appreciate Randall Colomouani's performance in the match? Yeah, I mean, that was the big sort of question mark going into this international break was whether Marcus Turam and or... Randall Kolomwani would succeed in making a case for a starting place at the World Cup because I think the feeling is that Olivier Giroud is probably not going to go into this tournament as France's first choice striker. Turam didn't have a great game against Germany, although you know France on the whole didn't really show up. Um, uh, but yeah, Kolomwani was was man of the match against Chile, and he's had a pretty tough time of it since he joined PSG last summer. I mean, unexpectedly, Luis Enrique decided that he was going to start using Kylian Mbappe as his first-choice centre-forward. Bradley Bacola has emerged as first-choice on the left-hand side. You've got Usman Dabeli on the right-hand side. And so Colin Wani is like barely gets a game for PSG. But Didier Deschamps really likes him. Mm. Um, and I think he likes his... You know, he's got a slightly atypical profile. You know, he can be a number nine. He can play wide. There's, there's, he's got pace. He's got creativity. And he showed both sides of, of that. Um, against Chile, heads in the, uh, the goal that puts France 2 on up from Mateo Hernandez cross, and then fantastic assist for Olivier Giroud to tap in the third goal. And Colomani is quite unusual as a modern footballer in that he is a right-footed, a right-footed attacking player who prefers to play on the right rather than on the left. So he, he, you know, he, he, he doesn't want to be kind of cutting in, you know, like mm. c- curling in. Um, as, as so many, you know, right-footed, left-sided modern players do, he's quite happy, you know, kind of ploughing a, 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 a like furrow. A bit like Brennan Johnson, yeah. And, and, you know, the assist for Giroud sort of um, exemplified that perfectly. So I think that was the main kind of take-home for France over the, over the international break. Really disappointed performance against Germany. Shaky performance against Chile. They're letting in loads and loads of goals at the moment. Um, you know, important players sort of underperforming. Antoine Griezmann wasn't available and was badly missed, but at least Kolomwani is showing that he, you know, he might be an option for the Euro. Deschamps was quite critical of Saliba publicly and obviously from a Premier League perspective he's had such a good season. What's the the view on that and on and on Saliba, I guess, generally in France? Because it does feel like for the national team he's either not really playing or his manager's criticizing him. Whereas in the Premier League it feels like he can do no wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that Deschamps has actually kind of expanded on what it was in um, Saliba's game that that displeases him. Because he basically talked to him and said, you know, but there are still some things that he needs to improve on. Um, I guess the, you know, the, the situation that France have is they have a really talented mm. collection of centre-backs. You know, first choice at the World Cup was Daiwa Pamikano and Ibrahim Makanate. That will probably be the case at the Euro. You've got Benjamin Pavard as well as another option. So he's he doesn't have quite as high a profile with France as he does with Arsenal, for example, where he's obviously, you know, clearly one of the one of the main men. Um, but yeah, kind of interesting that Deschamps, you know, felt that he was, you know, deserving of a little kind of mm. public prodding. He obviously, you know, isn't quite at the level that the, the Deschamps is looking for. But given that none of France's defenders are, are really doing the business at the moment, it's not it's not as if he's, you know, everyone else is outperforming him. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Interesting. San Marino, did they win? No. They played, though, against St. Kitts and Nevis, or Nevis, depending upon your preference. They drew this time. So, baby steps. Ooh, Liechtenstein, Latvia. Did you see the remarkable mm. opening goal in that? 14 seconds into the match, Latvia defender Marcus Oss decides to pass back to his keeper. He's pretty much on the goal line himself. Somehow, he slots it into his own goal because the keeper's gone wandering off the other the other way but yeah 14 seconds in what a way to begin a match very very entertaining yeah mm. seek that out if you haven't seen it also very entertaining was Spain Brazil that finished 3-3 Spain again conceding but looking really impressive going forward Yamal was a fantastic almost Don, Danny almost goal was absolutely mm. magnificent as well Spain oh you had your your fella Lucas Pacatar with a penalty really Last late minute. on, yeah. yeah, to to earn the well, it wouldn't be a point, but you know, to earn a draw. Endrick came off the bench and scored a brilliant goal. That's two and two for the 
young teenager. I just think he's got a future ahead of him. <laughs> You've always said it. I've always said it. And yeah. Oh, and also England drew with Belgium. Woo! Which I quite enjoyed. Did you quite enjoy yeah, that, Charlie? There was loads going on. There was. I mean, England were shaky defensively, created loads. Yeah. It wasn't one of, you know, often traditionally England friendlies, there's not a lot happening. Mm. But in this one, there was. Okay. Um, Four goals. Two defensive howlers yeah. setting up Yuri Tillemans to paraphrase Cat Stevens. It was two for the Tillemans. Very good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but then you had an incredible owned. cross that Lukaku. Oh, lovely, yeah. oh, really sensational, oh. gorgeous, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I which he, had, he had done before. For, there was a clip circulating him doing it before for Everton. Mm. Similar kind of cross. Yeah. And there's something about a diving header, a mm. back post diving header like that in the rain. Mm. That just kind of. Yeah, lovely. Just kind of. Elevates it. Elevate, elevates it a couple of notches. Generally for England, though, I thought England were great. I thought there were loads of positives to come out of this game. And I think, you know, obviously the last minute equalise from Bellingham puts a nice gloss on it so no one's moaning afterwards. Um, but first, <laughs> yeah, that'll stop them. <laughs> well, I think it kind of has. Like, there would have been a lot of nonsense about two losses in a row, mm. despite the fact that England were very, very... They were much better than Belgium in this game. Mm. And some, some positives to come out of it. Kobe Mainu... I think now it's very hard to argue that he doesn't start yeah, I think he will. for England. Like He basically sh showed in this game against top opposition that he can do a bit of everything, like everything that we need from that role. He's, you know, he can tackle, he can mm. play the simple pass when he needs to, he can burst into space when it's available. He's more sort of dynamic uh, than, than uh, Henderson. He's more disciplined than Conor Gallagher. He's got to start. And he was man of the match against uh, you know, a top five Team, so yeah, absolutely brilliant. There are other positives. I thought Tony, right? He's sort of, I think, over these two games has won the battle of who is the the the, 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 backup, the, the, the backup striker, just because he's much more Harry Kane shaped. He can drop deep and hold the ball up. Um, he's not he's not he's not as much he's not as much of a front foot striker as as um, uh, Watkins, but that's not what Kane is. And if the team is kind of built around a Harry Kane, I think it's got to now be. Um, Ivan Tony in the awful uh, you know, situation that Kane doesn't play and penalties I was going to say yeah it could be useful for a shootout we are exactly if you want to win a tournament these days it's pretty likely you're going to have to get through a, through a shootout so yeah I think I think Tony definitely played his way into it and there were other Jared positives Bowen, Bowen really well. good really, I'm very, very proud of him Jim Bowen <laughs> yeah because he, has, he's never, he hasn't had that game for England yet he's looked okay but he was really good and I think again has put his name down as the number one replacement for Saka and okay. that's probably ahead of Cole Palmer, by the way, which mm. some people might not like. Um, mm. And Chilwell was much better. He was a bit dodgy against Brazil. So yeah, mm. loads of positives. Because Chilwell, again, he will play some part in the Euros because sure, even if yeah. he's fully fit, isn't going to last a full tournament. Uh, is this, by contrast, the last time we'll see Lewis Duncan in England? Sure. Oh, it's really sad because he actually wasn't that bad apart from that mistake. Mm. And the, 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 the problem, this is one of the only negatives to come, to come out of this. If, if, yes, he was the one to flunk the audition... Well, then there's a question mark over who is the number one guy to, to, to replace Harry Maguire if he's not fit. And I think we should have at least had a look at Branthwaite over the two games. That was weird. It was weird. Like, why call him up if you're not even going to have yeah. a look at him? The next, the, the next two games England plays after the squad announcement. Right. Because I think so that... Bosnia and Herzegovina is one, is that right? Bosnia, it's the big ones. Bosnia and Iceland. Oh, yeah. Um, and because, yeah, I think that if Stones is injured, I think the natural next in line is Gwehi. But Gwehi, again, is, 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 you know, he's, he's had knee surgery. I'd be very, very worried about taking him to a Euros if he's barely played. Um, then, and then there's, there's, there's Cole Will, maybe, who's another natural replacement for Stones. Gomez. Go, yeah, do you want Gomez at centre-back starting in a Euros? I don't well, think you do. Um, do you remember a few it. years ago, somebody made, like, there was this kind of absolute glut of right-backs, and someone made like, yeah. the right-back the right at English 11. Mm. It's funny that fast-forward like, a couple of years, and we've got Esri Concer playing at right-back, yeah. who I'm pretty sure wasn't on it in that, in that 11. Like, that is, is a major caveat to the two goals that we conceded in this game. Like, a back four of, what was it, Concer, no, it, it, Gomez who came on, yeah. Concer, Dunk, and Chilwell. Like, that is probably our, not even our second choice mm. you know, back four. So, that, well, I, would I think, say forgives the two goals. In, in Conter's defence, he's been playing at right-back quite regularly for yeah. Villa this season and yeah, doing yeah. really well. And England don't have a glut of options at centre-back. You know, you kind of look at the team every time Harry Maguire is starting well, and think, how is Harry Maguire yeah. still starting? You look at the other options and there aren't all that many. I mean, and Cole I wonder Will's whether... I thought was going to... I thought he was mm. brilliant last season mm. at Brighton and just... 
hasn't Cole, really kicked on. Where he dunk, there's now maybe a question mark. But Branthwaite, I think, is, is, you know, just to slightly repeat myself, like he is, he reminds me so much of when Harry Maguire was coming through at Hull. Like his emergence this season at Everton, Branthwaite, he's got. He's got all of those things that really brilliant younger Harry Maguire had. So he's just the natural next in line, I think. But I think it will still, I think Dunk is still probably ahead of him just mm. because of his What, what are the brilliant things of a young Harry Maguire? Young Harry Maguire at Hull was really, really good. The same as the young Harry Maguire at Leicester so, was really, really good. Yeah, but so what were the... Dominant in the air, mm. um, fantastic um, and aggressive at set pieces, surprisingly calm when advancing with the ball. He, st he still kind of is. It's just he hadn't built up this body of errors that we now slightly associate Harry Maguire right. with. You know, don't don't forget, Man United paid eighty odd million for him for a reason. He was mm. one of the best kind of young to you know, middling. Wood, wood, that was, wasn't the reason. <laughs> Say again. No, I was when you said for a reason. I went Ed Woodward, but I'm just being sure, sure, sure. Privileged. But I mean, I remember like early Harry Maguire when he was at Sheffield United and Hull. Mm. The Even thing earlier. that the thing that stood out the most was how much he would get on the ball mm. and just go for it. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. just barrel through teams. Right. Um, and it was a very unusual thing to see from uh, an English centre back. And what's notable now is that when, you know, on the rare occasions where he um, allows himself a forward foray with the ball at his feet, he looks really cumbersome. Like there was a clip that did the rounds on Twitter a little while ago. He'd found himself on the left wing during the United game. It was like, what is Harry Maguire doing? <laughs> it's like the polar bear in Arkansas or whatever that, that does the rounds every now and again. But that was like a big part of his game. Are you not familiar with this? With this? Polar bear in Arkansas. It's like a meme. It's a picture of a polar bear. Yeah. And the caption is like, what the hell is a polar bear doing in Arkansas or something? Right. And every now and again, people will use it when something unexpected happens in sport. And that's Harry Maguire on the left wing. That's what it looks like now. But I mean, that, right. used, to, yeah, that used to be his natural game. Okay. Uh, very brief word on Belgium. What did you make of them? Yeah, I don't think they'll be... I, I, I don't think they're one of the big favourites at the Euros. I, didn't, I thought they were good in parts, mm. but I also thought England created a huge amount against them. And they've, England were way better. They, Sorry. They've got... What is a polar bear doing in Arlington, Texas? Arlington. Not that Arlington. Makes more sense. Sorry. Down south. Sorry. Okay. Get your memes right. Um, but Belgian, no. Yeah, not, I mean, not for you, Charlie. I think, you know, they've got players playing there like Jan Vertonghen, who, mm. you know, incredible career as a whole. Yeah. But, you know, if we're sort of complaining about Harry Maguire and, you know, as being a bit past his best, mm. then... Well, the penalty, Tony just completely explo exploited yeah. him, you know. Indeed. Uh, the injuries that have been picked up by Man City defenders in these past two friendlies... Uh, John Stones this time and Carl Walker in the previous game. What's the word on those ahead of the fairly important fixture coming up on Sunday? Well, both doubts, I think. Are Carl they? Walker, hamstring. Mm. John Stones, I think Southgate said it was an adductor I, issue. Oh. And as ever, when these international breaks come around, and particularly when it's friendly games, you get the, the familiar glut of players withdrawing from the squad. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, shortly before it's announced, sometimes shortly afterwards. And there's, you know degree of criticism you know, Bakayo Saka pulled out um, of, of the England squad this time around looks like he's probably going to be okay for that game against City um, okay they're, they're, I guess there probably weren't doubts over Stones and, and Walker when they were called up and when the squad first got together but it does I mean this is not to defend clubs that mm. basically in borderline invent excuses mm. for withdrawing their players from international squads but when you see the consequences it can have you kind of see why yeah. they do it I mean City De Bruyne didn't, wasn't playing for Belgium it sounds like Walker uh, was quite positive mm. the initial I mean I really I'm sure there are good reasons to not do this but having this international break now mm. just invites this kind of exploitation by clubs. And by the way, it's often kind of borderline things. A player's been carrying an injury for a long time. Now would be a good time to rest. But why not put this two weeks, why not let the season finish and then have it all internationals? Have, yeah. have, an, have the two weeks then. Mm. And then you've almost got a camp, right? Two week camp. And then you decide your squad. You play the games then. Players aren't going to be withdrawing from that because it's like, well, you can't really. You need to be in the squad. And you don't have this weird situation. Like most, a lot of fans would have been watching these friendlies, basically player camming their player, saying, please don't play a hamstring, like don't get hurt. Like it, it really devalues it. Whereas these games would have a lot more going for them at stake. If they were played in late May, the, the club season's done. Mm. And now there's no club football to think about or worry about. It's international football time. And suddenly these friendlies mean a whole lot more. Well, indeed. There was a push a few years back to try and take all the 
internationals out of the domestic calendar and stick them in a large block in the summer. But uh, yeah, that didn't. I just that think we'd be a lot more engaged in, in, in international football then. I hear you. Give you much time to pick your squad. That might so be. Give only... you less time. I mean, you've got. You'll have two. You just have to do it more in a snapshot. Anyway, yeah. it's not happening. It's so not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on because next up we're going to hit that Premier League match day thirty. Hey, welcome back, Premier League. It's been too long, right? Hasn't it, Tom? It feels like it has been a long time. Well, it has been a long time since we had a full round of a Premier League fixtures because the last Premier League, League games pre-international break were on that weekend that the also FA had Cup all the FA Cup yeah. quarterfinals, oh, yes. many yes. of which three were weeks. I mean, that's, that's you know, very well, high-profile games. Got coming up. Saturday lunchtime, feast your eyes on Newcastle West Ham at three. Scan the internet for news of Chelsea, <laughs> Burnley, Sheffield United, Fulham, Nottingham Forest, Crystal Palace, Bournemouth, Everton and Spurs, Luton. At 5.30, why not enjoy the Midlands stylings of Aston Villa Wolves with your tea before at 8pm settling down to some Brentford, Manchester United. 8pm though. Mm. How are the away fans going to find... Oh yeah, no, that's OK. Two games on Sunday at 2, Liverpool face Brighton and at 4.30, yes... Let's just get straight to it. Man City Arsenal, which is, I just think, is quite important. <laughs> <laughs> it does it have has that feeling. That feeling. It has that, that feeling. feeling. The big three, you will recall, separated by just one point. And this is the last of the head to head meetings between your Arsenal, mm. your Liverpool, your Man City. Arsenal, who've been very much the dominant team when they faced the other sides, a couple of draws and victories. So they beat Man City already, they beat Liverpool, drew as well with yeah. Liverpool. Whereas the other teams have, in Arsenal's case, taken the maximum points off each other when they played each other. So mm. Liverpool drew both times. So yeah, they've done well out of these big games. All right. It's huge. I mean, especially as this... So beating City in the league was the big thing Arteta hadn't done. And then they beat them in October. But then the really big thing is going to the Etihad and getting anything, getting close. So they've, they've played them four times uh, under Arteta. Lost 3-0, 1-0, 5-0 and 4-1. One that one goal was a late consolation. So that's an aggregate 13-1. They've mm. lost these games. And, they, and this equivalent fixture last year settled the title. They got battered. Um, and so it does feel like, well, how far have you come? This is such a good test and a chance to see where they are relative to City. What do you think the difference might be about this Arsenal this time? Well, I think Rob Holding not playing centre-back and them having Saliba there is mm. enormous as a difference. They, there is also a feeling that whereas then they were completely running out of gas and exhausted physically and mentally, this time they've paced themselves a bit better, dare I say in a slightly City-esque way. That's very much been Arteta's aim, that rather than last year peaking really early and then faltering to do more what, what Guardiola City do or what Fergie's United used to do. Uh, their squad generally is stronger, assuming there aren't um, sort of in injuries from the international break. Mm. And if Martinelli's fit, they'll actually have you know players they can bring off the bench. Uh, and they're so much better off the ball. I mean, the big thing in this game last year, Partey, who looked spent, was just De Bruyne was just running through him mm. the whole game. This season, obviously, their big issue last season was off the ball. So they went and spent 105 million on probably one of the best off the ball players in the world and also brought in Kai Havertz for a lot of money and he's very right. good off the ball. So De Declan versus De Bruyne is going to be fun. And Declan versus Rodri. I mean, mm. those those are probably the two best central midfielders in the Premier League, possibly in Europe. They're, they'd be right up there. So that's going to be, in theory, the big difference, that they won't be steamrolled in the way they were. Going back to Kai Havertz, who's in rare form at the moment, scoring four in his last four Premier four League games, a couple Premier of assists. Yeah. And has a bit of history with Man City as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, what's been the difference about that and why would he be so key in, in terms of them beating the press or what? Yeah, that's a huge part. I mean, he, he started actually up front for us on the Community Shield against City and did really well. Uh, he's far better in the air, obviously, than, you know, Gabriel Jesus is quite good in the air for someone of his size, but he's five foot nine. Havertz is six foot four and good in the air. They can beat that press go direct to him. That's what they did in that game. Obviously, he's got the Champions League final goal against them. But things have really changed. You know, he's he's basically had to go and play as the number nine because Jesus has been out mm. for most of this uh, eight-game winning run. Uh, and they've looked really good doing that. And he gives them a lot off the ball as well. He works really hard. Him and Odegaard often play almost as like two tens up front is the system. Uh, so, yeah, that is the idea that if City are pressing them, they have that out ball. I think it, 
Martinelli being fit or not is massive mm -hmm. because City do leave those big spaces in behind. Is he, is he fit? We don't know. I mean, he's been out for a little while with a deep cut uh, to his foot. Um, he hasn't played. About his record collection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that hit him and Walker, if one of them's out, that's massive mm. for either team. But I think they'll... Arsenal will look at, you know, City played United recently and obviously they won and they were far the better side. But there were a lot of times where Marcus Rashford's running in behind and if they'd had a bit more composure, there were chances there. City are not as formidable defensively as they've been in most of the previous season, few Sounds seasons. Sounds like you're making Arsenal Well, no, I think, there's, I, I, I think it will be close. I think City will I think Arsenal will push City to play at a level they maybe haven't done this season. I think it's going to be really high quality, really high level. And I think City might just about come through it. Um, but I don't think it'll be like anything like that 4-1 game last season. Okay. I Tom? mean, it's, it's easier to make a case for Arsenal going into this game than it has been at you know, any time in recent years. Um, I think, as, as Charlie mentioned, one of the big evolutions in Arsenal's football this season has been the extent to which they control their matches. You go back to that game at the Emirates in October when they beat City, albeit it took a deflected shot from Martinelli right at the end of the game. But they restricted City to a single shot on target. And when they beat Liverpool at the Emirates uh, in February, it was the same again, a single mm. shot on target for, for Liverpool. Um, so there is a, a, a greater sort of control to their game. And also form-wise... OK, City have been winning games, but they haven't been particularly impressive. Uh, and, you know, we used to talk about teams being in title winning form. Arsenal's form this year, eight straight wins, some ridiculous score lines. You know, 5-0 against Palace, 6-0 against West Ham. Apologies, Benji. 5-0 mm. at Burnley, 6-0 at Sheffield United, put three goals past Liverpool, past four goals past Newcastle. They're beating every team that comes up against them. And you can imagine it happening again. <laughs> they had a big wobble, you know, uh, this season. At the end of December, they looked absolutely spent. You know, a couple of defeats um, to West Ham, notably. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, the, the yin and yang of the, uh, the <laughs> West Ham supporter experience. And then at, at Fulham, and they looked done. And since then, they've looked sensational. Warm weather training. Mm. Warm weather training, that'll help. Um, and yeah, this thing, you know, Havertz playing through the middle, um, which was not, I don't think, what Arteta had in mind when he first no. signed him. I think his vision was that he would be he was one of the, the number Jacques, eights. Yeah. Um, and he's pushed him. And I think it was, that, it was the Liverpool game in February that we saw that you know, for for the first time it, during this recent run of games, and it's it's worked brilliantly. So, yeah, I, I think City would still be favourites because it's City. But in terms of form, in terms of momentum, in terms of the way that Arsenal have progressed as a team over the last twelve months, I think they'll you know they'll go into this with more realistic hopes of victory than you know than for a long time. Very right. quick note: Havertz doesn't feel like a six foot four player, does he? Hmm. Like some some players seem shorter than they yeah. are. Is it because he's a bit skinny and he's I a think bit so. slopey shouldered? Jorginho talked about this actually. He said he's it's misleading because yeah. I think his demeanour there's almost like a bit of the Urzil sort of demeanour yes. about him. He can feel a bit, a bit languid, kind of, yeah, a bit languid and like he doesn't care. I th from what Jorginho was saying, he's a lot kind of tougher and harder yeah. than he appears. He gets well, a lot of Harry bookings. Harry Maguire's 6'4". You don't think of Havertz as being the same size as no. Harry Maguire. Havertz for me is quite ghostly. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 he's drawn. Yeah. Yeah. Quite kind of knock need. Yeah, in his way of running, yeah. despite uh, and occasionally sickly child, <laughs> a sickly child. But uh, like, oh. if a ball is fired into Havertz, you think yeah. one of two things is going to happen. He's going to either it's either going to like hit his knee and bounce out for a throw, and or he's going to produce this like gossamer touch. Yeah, he can. That'll have the entire stadium off their feet, and I think that adds to his that adds to his charm nice. as a footballer. All right, uh, that's happening Sunday at four thirty, and it's big. How big is the match which precedes it on Sunday, which sees Liverpool entertaining Brighton? Brian always seemed to do well against Liverpool. They famously drew 3-3 yeah. at Anfield in De Zerbi's first game in charge. They beat Liverpool 3-0 last season at the Amex as well, knocked them out of the FA Cup. This time around, they've had a bit of an up-and-down campaign, but they did have a 2-2 draw at the Amex back in October with Liverpool. And I do think this game could slightly change the feel of the City Ooh. Arsenal game coming just before. If Liverpool were to drop points mm. in that, mm. suddenly... For both Arsenal and City, a win becomes a that bit less imperative, and I feel a draw might become a bit more likely. Whereas ah. if Liverpool go and smash Brighton, mm. then you know I think one of Arsenal and City is thinking like we or both is thinking we really kind of need to win this game, or you know it, it becomes that much bigger. Um, 
But this should be interesting. I mean, Brighton are such a hard team to read. I mean, they just veer, certainly last season and a bit this, veering from really good result to a really terrible one. And yeah. so, you know, I, it's hard to know which one will turn out. They've been really unlucky with injuries as well, Brighton. Yeah. Well, say. let's see what happens. Meantime, Benji, you've come correct with a bunch of research on Liverpool's physical approach this year. Yeah, we'll Is get there. Right? We're going to go into a brief tunnel, but we're going to come out in Liverpool. Okay. So... What's this about? In sp- <laughs> watching the... <laughs> what's, what's it really about, Ben? In the, going back to international football, sorry, Jimbo. In the Brazil versus England game, yeah. I was really... When frankly, Brazil, England, England us. Yeah, yeah, I was really impressed by Brazil's fouling. Yes. Because they kept on doing these it little Lucas fouls. Lucas Paquetara. Yeah, West exactly. Ham, and it, it? And it, but they were sort of getting away with it. And at the end of that game, yeah. um, Brazil had committed twice as many fouls as England, but uh-huh. they both got a yellow card each. So for me, I was, everyone was saying, oh, dirty b****s, whatever. I was like, no, this is really clever. This is smart. Like... Smart fouling is, 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 a, is, a, is a really interesting thing. So I, wanted, I did some analysis and looked at the Premier League, players in the Premier League, right. to try and work out who the best and worst fowlers well, are. Well, traditionally, it's Rodri, isn't yeah. it? Well, no, you'll That's be surprised. So, I'm going to be surprised. Just, Listener, stand by for surprises <laughs> after just to, this. Just, just do, no, some definitions to start right. with. Okay. A good fowler yeah. is somebody who commits lots of fouls and gets few yellow cards. Right. What about Robbie Fowler? How does he a fit Robbie Fowler is a player from the 1990s for okay. Liverpool. Yeah. And a bad fowler is somebody who doesn't commit many fouls but gets lots of yellows, right? right. And, and the baseline is yeah. that... On average, it takes six fouls to get a yellow card. Is that right? And obviously not like in a single game. If you did six fouls in a game. Six? Well, because it's, it, it's often over a number of games. So you do two fouls in um, one game, two in the next, two in the next, and then in one of those, you'll get a yellow card. So right. six is the baseline, right? So I looked at the, the top 50 <laughs> best foulers in the league. Stay with us, listen. And, the t- and also, the, it's much funnier looking at the top 50 worst foulers in the league. So okay, yeah, yeah. The best foulers in the league... Um, Liverpool had the, the most players in the top 50. Right. So their, their seven players in the top 50 have accumulated 147 fouls between them, mm. which has yielded only five yellow cards. Amazing. That's almost 30 fouls per card. Remember, the baseline is six, right? Six, yeah. And the top is actually, it's forwards. Who are these people? Well, the, dirt, the, be, the, the smartest foulers um, are usually forwards because they do... Yeah, but what your name is, Benji? Diego Jota, uh, 27 Ooh. fouls, okay. yeah. one yellow card. Mm. Cody Gakbo, 22 Ooh. fouls, no yellow cards. That baby Z- face. Zabojlai, 23 Ooh. fouls, one yellow card. More impressive for a central midfielder, I think. Um, he's, the best, he's the best midfielder. He's better than Rodri and the rest at right. fouling. Um, and going back to my initial, original thesis, there was only one England that. player yeah. in the entire top 50. One England player. And that was Jared Bowen. Now, oh, sorry, Charlie, that's your fault. <laughs> now we turn to the bad foulers. Jared Bowen. Foul Jared foul. Bowen is the only England player in, in that in that top fifty. Now on to bad foulers. These are people that don't foul much, but yet get yellows. Eight England players in the top fifty. Nine if you include Ben White. Um, but the top two is really quite funny. So um, I think anyway. Uh, in at number two. Trent Alexander-Arnold really has committed five fouls this entire season and picked up five yellow cards. But, wow. but hang on a second, are the yellow cards always for fouling? Mostly, I couldn't tell uh, that from the data. Uh, but this is. But then in at number uh, one, right? Wonderfully, yeah. is Jack Grealish, who has also Jack committed Grealish. five fouls this season. And how many and fouls up he had against six him? yellow cards? I wonder if um, he's produced more yellow cards than he's actually almost the, certainly. Yeah. Um, but looking at the team, so what players were in the in the list of the worst? Fowlers in the league. Right. Chelsea, again, seven players, same as Liverpool, but in the opposite direction, right? Oh. So they have accumulated 128 fouls, these right. seven players, and picked up 37 yellow cards. That's 3.5 fouls per yellow card versus okay. Liverpool's 30 fouls per it's yellow amazing. card. Do you I think, think Pochettino has talked about this, that, that his players need to stop giving away silly yellows? Is it something yeah. you can teach? Well, it's, well kind, it's kind probably. of a testament to the virtues of gegen pressing. Why do Liverpool commit lots of fouls in areas of the pitch where you you're unlikely get, to get a booking? Yeah, it's totally. because they press so aggressively as soon as they lose the ball. And this right. is kind of and borne out by that. As well, you, yeah. think, you think about the City teams the last sort of, 10 years, or well, the Guardiola City teams, they're always doing little fouls. Yeah, run out for it. And but it's, it's those... where you do them. Yeah. Completely. It's yeah. about having mm. a proper... Anywhere else on the pitch, that exactly. would be a foul. No, but it's exactly. having a proper mm. shape. Like, look right. at someone like United and Casemiro. Mm. The reason he's you, he's not protected, he's having to cover spaces that are just way too big for him. Mm. So he's being exposed. And you saw that, actually, with Arteta's Arsenal. One of the big things he did was to... You think of that, like, Emery, late Wenger that you mentioned, and Xhaka's just 
give, getting bookings all the time because he's being asked to play in a way that he can't. Once you actually control the spaces in a better way, like I think Arsenal's something mad. Last season, they barely got a red card in the Premier League. Whereas for Arteta's first two or three years at the club, they were the worst for red cards. But once you learn how to play in that city way of not leaving yourself exposed, you can get, or Liverpool, (laughs) yeah, yeah, you can get away with Rodri Fernandinho, the best in the business. But also, it shows, it's funny that English, you know, this was, this is predicated on being worried that England weren't good at founding. It's funny how English football has improved and moved forward in so many different ways. Maybe one of the, you know, look at our national side, we're really good. you were saying that loads of England players were in the worst fouling. Yeah, exactly. We're bad at fouling. England needs, England needs to become good at fouling. Ah, which is funny, you know, as you say, that's, yeah, it's not our our reputation. But then then this is the history of football. Right. This is the entire history of football right here. England invents the game and invents (laughs) all the different aspects of the game. Teaches foreigners how to play football and do the other football related things and foreigners get better at every single aspect of the game not podcast, including fouling <laughs> and then England have to but relearn that, doesn't it. that speak to the, this idea that we're not cute enough we're not uh, exactly. smart and streetwise enough it, uh, that's exactly what I think it sort of it holds up fouls Jim groundbreaking Bob. research it's cool, amazing yeah. that's amazing it's genuinely uh, mind expanding and eye opening hasn't left us too much time sorry no no but I mean in a good way because it, uh, all we would have been doing it's just running through f- the fixtures that are coming up and suggesting what we think might happen. But it's all just chitter and chatter, isn't it? Those games are going to take place. <laughs> Ultimately futile. It's not raw yeah. data, is it? Uh, it's not raw data, you're right. But just in case you would like to hear a word or two on the other matches coming up this weekend, we'll do that next. All right, so kicking things off Saturday lunchtime, Newcastle West Ham. Boy, hasn't the pendulum swung again for West Ham? I remember recently you were in Benjin, it was all doom and gloom over in East London, but now, now you've only lost one of the last six, scoring loads of goals. You have drawn Bayern Leverkusen in the Europa League, which is challenging, mm. but by and large, these are good times for the Hammers. It's really simple, Jimbo. Yeah. Paquetar. Paquetar. Yeah. He was out for two months, didn't win a game, got knocked out of the FA Cup by Bristol City. Since he's been back, we're unbeaten in four in the Premier League and we smashed Freiburg to get into the quarters of the Europa League. Like, yeah. that's, that's kind of it. Once, when, when you've got him, Bowen and Kudus, probably the best forward line outside of maybe the top five, probably better than United's. And, it, and I had this sort of startling thought the other day that West Ham's forward line is probably worth about a quarter of a billion pounds. Like, a quarter of a billion pounds. In today's pounds. market, you, get, you could get close to 100. Exactly. Tom's put his little and, finger in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Pagatar and, and, and Kudus, you could get close to yeah, 100. Nice. Are you going to... Are you going to do Newcastle away Saturday lunchtime? I think we've got a really good chance. We're on good form and they've, they're riddled with injuries. Riddled. And no Trippier, which I think really diminishes them as mm. a side. So, yeah, I, I think yeah, so. Yeah, I said a couple of weeks ago, Benji, on this podcast, I thought Pakatar was up there with Joao Paulinho as the player that a team can most not do without. Now, Paulinho actually full and went and proved me wrong because they won some games without they him. Did, but Pakatar absolutely yeah. has proven that point. I just think that Pakatar is so important to West Ham. Tom? <laughs> he is. Well, I think one of the most enjoyable things about Pakatar is how slow he is. Mm. Um, because at uh, you know, a time when football is, is quicker than ever, the fact that you've got a guy who basically only has two gears but mm. is still able to just boss things. And I would uh, thought of this watching the highlights of the, the Brazil-England game. She's playing alongside Bruno Guimarães and they were both at Ligue 1. Oh, yeah, they were yeah. both at Lyon, not at the same time, unfortunately for Lyon, but they both arrived and Leon were like, okay, we've signed these two Brazilian midfielders. And so when someone says Brazilian midfielder, you get an idea in your head, flamboyant, step overs, et cetera, et cetera. But actually they're, they're two very gritty footballers. Oh, they're they're right. And I think that's one of the reasons why they've both had so much success, but they're both extremely slow. And I remember thinking, watching them in Liga, it will be difficult for them to succeed in, in the Premier League. And once again, what do I know? His about aggression anything? has been the thing that I think surprised, surprised the West Ham fans. I've told you the, the I mean, this is, sorry, this is a segue. I've told you the anecdote about well, I've told you the story about Pakitar in Alkmaar. Mm. Um, yeah. I when he waded in when there was the trouble yeah. last year. Yeah, season, and yeah. The, the, but the, the idea was is that the West Ham players were all protecting their families but who were in the stands. He had no family there. He just wanted to scrap. It's a West Ham family. He didn't even family, like his family. <laughs> so, Bruno <laughs> Gimaraes, a tear up. Will Bruno Gimaraes be featuring for Newcastle? Yes. He's fit, isn't he? I think. So, yeah, yeah, he'll he'll be, yeah he plays. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, that'd be all right. Uh, West Ham are currently seventh, a little bit further up the table. You've got Villa, Spurs, and possibly, if you squint a little bit, Man United battling for fourth and fifth. Villa currently in fourth place on 56 points. Spurs are three points behind them, but they do have a game in hand. Six points behind Spurs are Man United. So, yeah, probably a prohibitive 
margin that. Yeah, Villa yeah, that get that Spurs uh, Luton game. You're going to Spurs Luton. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I mean, history. This is Luton's first visit to Tottenham since November 1991, mm-hmm. Charlie. Yeah. Do you remember I mean, what happened then? Uh, I do, because we talked about it the other day. Did you? View from the lane. Um, 4-1. Yeah. 4-1 for Spurs. Gary Lineker scored two, as did substitute Scott Houghton. Yeah. Those were the only goals he ever scored for Tottenham. Producer Ben points out that after he hung up his boots, he became a police officer. That's an unusual career path. And he also starred in Cop Squad on Sky. I imagine was that a kind of police football team type thing, was it? I mean, it's unfortunate that footballers are no longer obliged to... Become posties. Do jobs after. To embark upon peculiar secondary careers. I always remember Norman Whiteside, mm. former United winger, became a, a podiatrist, became a foot doctor, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, footballers, yeah. mm. they are no, they do know no a lot about a feet. They're no Aaron's, strangers to does, a foot. Does Zayu became a detective, no? I think. Is that right? No, yeah, right. the Wigan centre-back. Aaron, Aaron oh, yeah, Zayu. I, I imagine that plenty of footballers do still mm. take up work after. Uh, anyway, uh, none of this particularly informs our... Our expectations one, of one Spurs One thing of this Luton. game, Spurs Luton. No, first, right. thank you. Ben. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, is it about fouling? No, bear with me. In, and again, we're going to a small tunnel. Oh yeah. I play a fantasy football game uh, that that is not like normal sort of muggle fantasy football. It takes in all of the opta data and forms scores uh, for the players. So like, it's not just goals, assists, clean sheets. It's like aerials won. It's key passes. It's it's about twenty five different metrics or whatever, and it spits out a score. Right mm. now. Since the turn of the year, mm. um, the player with the highest score based on this kind of accumula- accumulated, um, the highest score based on this, uh, th- this method is playing in this game. Uh, who do you think it is? Alfie Doughty. Close. Ross Barkley. It's Ross oh. Barkley. And I feel sort of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not sorry to mention him pretty much every time I come on this mm. podcast because I j- he's having a sensational season. And if Luton stay up, PFA player of the year. They're currently 17th, sandwiched between Everton and Forest. 80. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, point yeah, seduction. Eight, eight, yeah, because of the of the changes since our last set of fixtures. But also, going back to the conversation we were having before about England mm. and, and Kobe Mainu now looking like potentially a nailed-on starter because he has such a unique skill set, what he's doing is not that dissimilar to what Ross Barkley is what doing is at now? Luton. Very similar kind right. of roles. And I guess there's a feeling that the, the boat has... Well, left the key when I, it comes to Ross Barkley in England, but, but he's doing similar things. Ironically, this, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. is the best Ross Barkley there's ever been, right? Mm-hmm. And ironically, he was getting into the England squad for ages and into the team when he was always sort of almost brilliant. But in fact, no, he, he never even got to almost brilliant. He was almost, he was always almost, almost brilliant. <laughs> but now he's actually a brilliant footballer. And it's sad that now he probably won't get into the team when mm. he was getting into the team when he wasn't as good. Luton had a phenomenal run. But it's kind of come to a crashing halt and they haven't actually had a victory since the end of January, that 4-0 over Brighton. They've only picked up three points in their last eight matches. They've been I mean, they were 3-0 in a few up, of them. 3 up at Bournemouth, yeah. lest we forget. And um, they've had games like in that run like United at home where you know, they're pretty unlucky not to get anything. Villa at home, they should have got something. Mm. Speaking of teams, though, whose form has fallen off dramatically, Charlie, mm. Spurs, who whose performance against uh, Fulham, Fulham, you dubbed the worst you'd ever seen by any football team ever. Oh, no, possibly it was just <laughs> under, Spurs under Ange. Spurs under Ange, yeah. yeah it's the worst, worst performance of this season. So what's happened at Spurs? Well, that was, a one, I mean, that was only one game, so... OK, but it, it's not been a good run of form. Uh, they've been in OK form. Have they? Yeah, I mean, it's been a little bit up and down, but they'd won their... Uh, they just won at Villa. The Villa yeah, they'd gone and battered now. Villa. You're right. And they beat Absolutely Palace right. just before then. They had lost at Wolves. They beat Brighton. So, yeah, it's been... OK. Yeah, three wins, two losses from the last five. Um, Fulham was weird. It kind of came out of nowhere because they had beaten Villa so convincingly. Mm. That felt like a real moment they'd kick on. Mm. Fulham were really good. I mean... But they just ruthlessly exploited Spurs down the flanks where Tottenham can be vulnerable. They invert both their fullbacks and Fulham were, were brave. They stuck both their wingers out there. They kept their position. They stayed high and they just created overloads. It was just happening also, all game. Speaking of Fulham, they got, uh, they're away at Sheffield United this season. Something that jumped out um, uh, looking at Fulham's stats... Anthony Robinson is... He was superb, Well, he, by the way, I think he's Spurs. maybe the best left-back in the league this season, or the, the, the highest performance. So, looking at his stats, I was pretty struck. He's made more interceptions than any other player, more 
ball recoveries than any other defender. He's third in the list of tackles won. Uh, going forward, he's third in successful take-ons, i.e. beating a man, and mm. you know, third in successful crosses, and he's got six assists. So like, the joint most assist in open play by a defender in the Premier League this season. Who's, is it is Soufal, the other one, possibly? Uh, uh, yeah, Soufal and Trippier. Yeah. So, I mean, that, I mean, that's sort of a steep, well, maybe not Soufal, yeah. but that's a steamed company. Rob, Robinson has been fantastic, and, and I'm sorry to say this, Fulham fans, just as Andy Robertson at, at Liverpool is starting to get a few more injuries and possibly declining as a player, I could sort of see him in the Liverpool side, Anthony Robertson. So, yeah, uh, Robinson, sorry. No, Robertson. Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. Yeah, Robertson, yeah. Which one are you two about? Anthony Robin Robinson. Replacing... Andy Robertson. Andy Robertson. Oh, so <laughs> Andy Robertson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. No, he was so good. First half, he was... Where the press box is at Fulham, he was on my side. Mm. And he was really impressive. Mm. And he set up the first goal in that game. Uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah, I mean, yes. though he's... Anthony. Yeah, though two he... E's. Oh, two E's. Though he grew up in Liverpool, I think. Yeah, it's annoying because he... I'd probably have him over Ben Chilwell, for example. Mm. Um, but hey-ho. Are we, are we sure about that? Because I think, he, yeah, he was British-American. Yeah, he, so he was born in Milton Keynes. Oh, there you go. And then was part of the Everton youth setup, uh, but represents the state. He's got 40-odd caps for America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Spurs, if they win that, will pull level with Aston Villa, who at 5.30 on Saturday will host Wolves at Villa Park. Can Villa hang on to that Champions League fourth spot? I don't think they will. Because um, they, I mean, oh, right, I was wrong about Spurs, but Villa genuinely are on a terrible... Run of form. I mean, they looked so cooked in that yeah. defeat against Spurs. And that mm. was the real sort of, this is the shootout for fourth place. And it wasn't that long ago that you thought, well, Villa have got this, you know, nailed on because the injury is really biting for Tottenham. And, you know, Man United were in, were in pretty poor form. But ever since, yeah, I mean, I think the signs were there before. But that, ge that, that game in particular, they were so comprehensively outplayed. And physically, they looked so spent that you, the, the thought of Villa sort of completely sliding down the table. And no John McGinn now. What, what a silly sausage. That, yeah. that sending off was so stupid. Yeah, it was. I mean, he's, that... the, he's their captain. He's, he's probably their most, he's arguably, after Watkins, their most important player. And in like the, the, the real sort of like, you know, the most important part of the season, he's now just ruled himself out for three games. They go, silly, they go away to City after this as well. I mean, that mm -hmm. game against Spurs, not only did they lose, they wiped out their goal difference advantage and lost probably yeah. their most important player for three games. Yeah, yeah. A pretty bad afternoon. City next, as you say, and then a couple of games after that is Arsenal. So Yeah, which he'll be back for. But yeah, I mean, they've got a big run. And also they're now navigating uh, Conference League knockout ties in amongst Premier League. And that, that Spurs game was sandwiched in between the two Ajax games and it very much looked like that. And obviously earlier on in the season when you're in the Conference League, you can manage it, you can heavily rotate. Mm. Their bench you can't really do their that. Their bench isn't very strong. No, and it looked, I mean, in that Spurs game, they yeah they didn't have a lot. I I think Spurs will outlast them. I, I just think they'll their legs will go. But fifth place might be enough. Yeah, anyway. could be enough. Could be enough anyway. Quick uh, check on the situation down the bottom end. Of course, there's been a further points penalty for Nottingham Forest. There's a potential for in the next week or so Everton receiving another alteration to their tally from a separate set of profit and sustainability breaches. Haven't Forrest also said they're going to appeal? They have indeed. And that means that the scenario in which the season could finish yeah, and there's still appe appeals outstanding, mm. I think now will happen, right? I don't know, Benji. No, it's, I'm pretty sure it now makes that entirely possible. Okay. Yeah. As it stands, barely worth me even reading this out, but as it stands, Blades are bottom. They're eight points off safety. They do have a game in hand, but that really only matters if you can win games, which they're <laughs> not traditionally very good at. Feels like there's not a PSR penalty big enough to save Sheffield United. Burnley maybe are a different kettle of fish. They're second last, but after that minus four for Forest, they're five points from safety. And and they've just beaten Brentford, yep. which is the first victory in quite a long time. And the the gap is only five points. Yeah. And with the potential for further points deductions, I think that the that that victory against against Brentford could, you know. Could it prove Could a it? platform? I mean, probably not. Probably Almost not. certainly not. But, you know, <laughs> who knows? Burnley 19th in 18th place. Are Nottingham Forest uh, just a point behind Luton on the right side of the dotted line. Then you've got Everton, who are four points from the drop, but with another potential penalty on the way. They do have a game in hand, the Toffees. 11 games of that a win now, Everton, in the league. Games. And then yes. above them are Brentford, who have 
a five-point cushion over the bottom three, but they also have one point from their last five games, no wins since the 10th of February, and Man United visiting on Saturday. Is this going to be more bad news for Brentford, or is it going to be like that time when Man United turned up in the oh, lime yeah. green kits oh, yeah. and uh, with a team featuring who was in it? Ronaldo and Sancho and Fred and stuff. It's amazing that's only last season. That yeah. feels so long ago. Um, and I, Brentford absolutely smashed them 4 0. Yeah, Bre- Brentford are weird. Like they've, against the biggest teams, they often change their formation and, and make themselves really hard to play against. I mean, you saw they, they very nearly got a point at uh, the Emirates in, in mm. that game a few weeks ago. I think Pinnock's back. Yeah. Makes a big difference. Yeah, I. I, I it's tricky to say. Like, I, I, I think you can say with confidence this will be a very difficult game for United but United have won a lot of games this season including the home game against Brentford where they scored two goals in stoppage time <laughs> right. so it's just whether they're able to kind of scrape through and dig out a win mm. um, United coming off that 4-3 victory over Liverpool of course yeah. prior to the break which you know in in a different context you might say well that's the kind of that's the kind of result the kind of performance that you could really build on but mm. you can't because it was just such a completely ridiculous game that United were not in control of at, at any time i think that the the positive sort of impact that 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 result has had is more to do with sort of the the mood around mm. the club because they're you know for good reason there's been a lot of negativity around United this season but that was a real win for the ages so yeah good for the vibes Everton as you mentioned eleven games without a win they at three o'clock go to Bournemouth who also aren't in the best of form and Bournemouth is Sean Dyche's favourite opponent he's beat them eight times in the Premier League that's significant. Yeah, big week this for Everton. As we mentioned, more penalties perhaps on the way. Chelsea are up against Burnley. If Burnley are going to work a great escape, a, an upset here would be a pretty nice way to get that thing underway. It did finish actually 1-1, this fixture at the bridge last season. Uh, that's taking place at 3 o'clock, as is Forest against Crystal Palace. And Sheffield United against the aforementioned Fulham. Wow. Very nice. Uh, a reminder that Tom's book Vava Voom is available on April the... By the way, can yeah. I just say, I've mm. just spotted the yeah. um, quotes from the front of yeah. his beautiful book. So we've got, first of all, from the esteemed Simon Cooper, excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing this in, in, in order. Uh, from Glenn Hoddle, yeah. fabulous. Yeah, lovely. And this I love. Yeah. From Christian Carambo. Mm. The definitive story. The definitive story. It's amazing. That's, a very, that's all... a very brief. He could have written this was not... I was expecting the definitive <laughs> yeah. story. And what, what was I left with? Any more Paul quotes? He, um, that's, who's that's your forward? A... Clarence Sadoff. Oh Sadoff. my you goodness, know, on the back. Jonathan Look. Wilson. Yeah, Clarence uh, Sadoff Brassel. did the introduction to his last book. Oh, for goodness did. sake. He did. Yeah. Goodness who wrote, who wrote the, uh, the forward, forward on three. this? Straight into the prologue. Boom. Boom. All right. Well, no I'm looking forward around. to awaying to read my copy of Va Va Boom and perhaps sharing some pictures on Pickfair and reading Charlie Eccleshire on The Athletic. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what you're going to be doing, but perhaps you'll find time Sunday evening, straight Monday morning, to join us as we round up all those matches. Uh, so, yeah, great. Have a great time in the meanwhile. Many thanks, Benji and Tom and Charlie and Liam and producer, guest producer Ben, old school, in the booth. And you, listener, will be back with you soon. For now, from all of us here, it's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around, and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.